you very much. Uh, let's see if this works. Yes. Is it? Okay. Maybe a little bit. Just. All right, my topic for today, the Albanian language and the Albanians, where did they come from? And uh, the picture symbolizes a popular belief also among scientists that they came from a mountainous area where they were able to uh, stay as a separate identity and not become Romans or Greeks or Slavs or anything else. And uh, it's a picture from the valley of Feth in northern Albania, a very pretty place. Now, um, as a scientist, you also begin, always or often begin with some caveats. So one of the main uh, messages maybe for today is that people are not language. Uh, in other words, a people is not the same as their language and vice versa. So the things that I'll be talking about today, there are two different kinds of descent, you might say, that we have to uh, take apart, to, to keep separate. One, the genetic descent of people, right? You inherit your genes from your parents and they've inherited from th their parents and so on and so forth. So if you know enough about your ancestors, uh, and about you know, the, the area where you live, you might eventually say, okay, these are, this is where I come from, right? These are my genes. This is my ancestry. Um, that's not the same as linguistic descent, right? Sometimes it can be, right? You, many people speak, speak the language of their parents, they imitate what their parents speak, and their parents have started to speak what their parents spoke, and so on and so forth. If this went on you know, for 80 generations, you get back to the year zero and you know, the language may have stayed the same at least. It's sort of one unbroken line, right? The language always changes, but it changes bit by bit, of course. Mm, but very many uh, times this is not the case and language, there are lang language breaks, right? Instead of speaking like your parents, you start speaking like uh, your friends, your neighbors, right? Uh, where I grew up, most people in my village they spoke a local dialect of the southeastern Netherlands, um, and especially the people of my parents' generation, but then they tried to speak uh, standard Dutch to their children and, and teach their children basically, first of all, to speak standard Dutch because they thought this was very important to get ahead in life afterwards. So then you get a switch. If enough people do this, right, you get a switch in language at a certain point. And there are, uh, well, all over Europe you can point at uh, examples of this uh, happening, like in Paris, for instance, in the year zero, they would have spoken Celtic, and later they started speaking Latin, and this became Romance and French. And uh, you can say the same for London, there have been different changes in language, or Berlin, first it was Slavic speaking, then it became German speaking, and so on. A bit more, uh, an example with even more switches, for instance, if you take the city of York in Northern England, uh, right, the genetic descent of people living in York now might be local, they might go back to people living there 2,000 years ago, because it's always been a town. Uh, but linguistically there are several switches that uh, have taken place. Right? Initially they probably spoke Celtic, uh, and then at a certain point during the Roman era, at least the cities and the east and the south of Britain started speaking Latin. <laughs> And then a few centuries later, the Germanic peoples come from overseas and uh, you get what we now call Old English. Right? So there's a switch to the Germanic language. And then a switch to another Germanic language when the Scandinavians, the Vikings, come to England, especially to the eastern and northern parts. Um, so Old Norse was certainly spoken in York in the 10th, 11th century. And then again, this was left for what we now call English a few centuries later. Right, so you have at least four shifts of language within one place. Right, and this is from a town of which we know quite a lot. We have written documents from all of this period, not from every year, of course, but uh, if we compare it, for instance, to the Balkans, it's a much better documented situation uh, for, for most parts. So you can imagine how complicated the situation can be, especially if you don't know so much about the history. So the question where did the Albanians come from uh, is ambiguous and I can ask at least several counter questions. Right? Do you mean the Albanian language? Do you mean 
the gene pool of the Albanians, so to say the genes of all the Albanians, which you now call Albanians together, or even part of them, uh, or doing in the name Albania, I'll also be talking about a little bit at the end of the origin of the name, an old and the modern name for uh, Albania. Um, let's take a quick historical look at some of the things we do know. Uh, and we start a few centuries before the Romans came to the Balkans. And there are several peoples of which we know that they lived uh, on the Balkans. Uh, to the south of Albania, you had the Greeks, which at that time already they called themselves a separate people, and we know their language, so that it was indeed a separate language. In other parts of the Balkans, right, you have the Illyrians in the southeast, so Albania, Montenegro, maybe that area, Thracians to the southeast, so in modern Bulgaria, Dacians further north, north of the Danube, uh, and the Messapians which are not on the Balkans, but in southeastern Italy, but which are mentioned already in antiquity as being related to the Illyrians. Uh, we don't know for all of them whether, yeah, what their language looked like and whether it was a separate language or whether they actually had more languages, because what we have of those languages mainly are inscriptions with names, but hardly any grammar or real vocabulary. They do all look like in the European languages, as far as you can tell by the names. Uh, now none of these uh, classifies as a clear ancestor of Albanian, of the Albanian language, as far as the language is concerned, but again that's for a large part because we just don't know what their language looked like. And then if you, uh, if you strike out those, nothing else is left on the Balkans of which we know anything except for Greek, which is not the ancestor of Albania, though Albanian, of course, has some loan words from Old Greek uh, from before the Roman era, but not many, at least not many in the Albanian that we have now. This is just a map uh, to be sure that we know what we're talking about, so the placement of Illyrian to the southwest, Thracian to the east, Dacian further north in Romania, and then Greek and Mesopic. All right. Then we get to the Roman era, and you see two languages uh, becoming more dominant, especially in the, let's say, international uh, traffic as languages of, of larger distance communication. So Greek to the south of a certain line and Latin to the north of a certain line, which I will show you in the map on the next slide. Now, Albanian has many loanwords from Latin, very many, but not from ancient Greek. So the general idea is that Albanian was in an area where Latin was the main language of, uh, of communication. So that Proto-Albania was spoken to the north of this dividing line between Greek and Latin influence. Uh, by Proto-Albanian, we mean an early stage of Albanian, of which we don't have written records. But we have to reconstruct it on the basis of what we know from later Albanian. Uh, and it's a stage from which then Tosk and Gag, the two main dialects, uh, grew apart. So here is just this line between Latin and Greek influence, very roughly on the map. We are not very sure, of course. Uh, it's called the Yuricek line after the first scholar who determined where the line more or less uh, should be, mainly on the part of inscriptions on stone right, that you find in the area, grave inscriptions, etc., put in Latin or in Greek. So Albanian would have been somewhere to the north of that line, straddling the line. Just to show some examples of what these Latin loanwords, these many loanwords that we have, look like. Uh, the Latin word, the Albanian word, and then the translation. So you see, usually the Albanian word has become a bit shorter, but you can still, after a while, you recognize those words. So amicus, the word for friend, has become mic. Right, hospitium has become shtepi, house, kivitat, and become chute, city. So the place of the distress, the accent is still as in Latin in most cases, and some other syllables have just disappeared. Right? Medicus has contracted to miek, uh, gentum has become chin, the word for hundred, 
So there the end has lost, has been lost. Ecclesia has become quiche for church. Familia has become familia, meaning child. And then paupum, for instance, has become pak. So there are, uh, for a large part, uh, you know, f frequent words that you use in every day, like house and city, and but also adjectives like little. So all over the vocabulary, you could say, you find Latin uh, words in Albanian. So uh, you know, sometimes I like to say it just Albanian just escaped becoming a Romance language, but you know maybe 100 years more and it would have become <laughs> a Romance language. But if we move on in time a little bit, uh, we find other languages with which Albanian has uh, some things in common, so with which they have been in contact. Uh, and one of them is Romanian. And we can see that Albanian and Romanian have some words in common. These not being the core vocabulary, but usually agricultural terminology, house terminology, some animals and plants. Uh, so if you look at the, the here, for instance, the Roman, uh, Romanian word uh, tsark and Albanian tsark for pen or enclosure, especially used for little animals, young animals, uh, you see they're very similar. Uh, and we think that they developed from a Proto-Albanian form tsarko, so the tz, 1500 years ago, became what is now the th in Albanian. And the various linguistic reasons to suppose that it was borrowed from Albanian into Romanian. Another example, right, Romanian piriu and Albanian perua for torrent, mountain, stream. And we would reconstruct Proto-Albanian perano, from something which flows very quickly. Uh, the word for badger, Romanian viezule, Albanian viedula, from a proto-Albanian viedzula. Right, the L between vowels in Romanian becomes an R regularly at some stage, early, uh, early enough. Uh, so this also shows you that the Albanian form is older. And also in Albanian, you can connect it with the verb viev, to steal, right? which is often used to derive animals like martyrs and weasels and which steal your chicken by night. Okay. Um, now, so this is, the direction is clear, but still you can make several scenarios for what exactly happens, right? You can say this is the word, but what did the speakers do? Uh, so one possibility is just that you have proto-Romanians and proto-Albanians living next to each other, communicating very often, and the Albanians had some uh, words that were useful, so the Romanians borrowed them. Maybe they didn't do these activities themselves, right, but they borrowed them. But I guess that proto-Romanians would have known badges anyway. Um, so the other option is that some of the proto-Albanians switched to speaking Romanian, and other parts remained Albanian, but some parts just started speaking Romanian, and these became the Romanians, and they took with them some of the words, you know, of the household terminology, which they used very often. Okay, I move on to the next uh, phase, the Slavic invasion. So, southward invasion from the Slavs from the 7th century, all over the Balkans. Linguistically, at that time, we know you already had Tosk and Gek, so it's a bit later than the Romanian period. We also know that you had side-by-side -side villages speaking Albanian, speaking uh, Slavic, some Latin, which then became Romanian, also in other terminology, Vlach. So we see by place names, you have lots of place names with Slavic etymology in Albania, right? The most famous one being Berat, was from Belograd. But there are well, probably thousands of others in Albania. Uh, just a map, uh, a tentative map. We don't know where Proto-Albanian was spoken, right? This is just basically a guess. But it would have been uh, to the north of the line between Latin and Greek. And Proto-Romanian close or overlapping. And then later the Slavs come uh, all over the place. Right? So very simple uh, representation. Now after 1300, as you know, the Ottoman Turks take over. Uh, and many Albanians from northern Albania spread southward into Greek, Greece, especially western Greece, and then into Italy, or also from Greece into Italy in the 15th, 16th century. 
Right, you get Skanderbeg in the middle of the 15th century, the last organized resistance, and then Turkish rule until 1912, which is what we're talking about today. Uh, well, it's impossible to list all the Turkish loan words that you have. You also have hundreds or <coughs> thousands of words um, from yeah, all over the vocabulary. That's some more modern words, but also social terminology, kitchen terminology, etc., etc. Also, exclamatives like tamam. Right? Uh, okay, this is just a map uh, of this migration. Uh, so nowadays we still have about 50 villages in Italy where Albanian is spoken from this period, whereas in Greece it almost has disappeared. Right? But 100 years ago there were still many places also in Greece from this migration period. Right, the last topic of my talk is the name of Albania. Uh, and I start, so there's actually two names, right? So I start with the older one, where the stem is Alban. Right, so it's attested already before Christ in the text of Ptolemy. Uh, Albanoi is the name for the people, and we have the town Albanopolis, although we don't know where that was situated exactly. Uh, much later, in the Byzantine period, uh, we get still the Albanoi or Arbanoi, so you see L and R uh, interchanging there, or if the text is more Greek-oriented, Albanitai or Arbanitai, and the country, part of modern Albania, let's say, called Arbanon. So as you, many of you know, the old diaspora, the ones that moved to Italy and Greece, still use this name, so Arbaresh in Italy and Arbanitai in uh, Greece. In the oldest Albanian text you find this word. And in southern Albania the region is called Labaria. At the southernmost part you see A and L have <laughs> changed position, so Labaria from Albaria. And the R is from N as is normal in Tosk, right, so from Albania. Right. So that's one. The other one of course the modern word is sheep. Uh, Shiperia, Shipe, Shiptar. It's first attested in 1685, so it's a much newer name applied to the people and the language. Derived from the word Ship, clearly, to speak, used for speaking clearly. And then you have a verb, Shipon, to pronounce. So this belongs to uh, a development that you often find in names for languages for people. So. This was the spoken language, the language of the people, the language that you could understand, as opposed to other languages, Latin, Italian, or Turkish, which were the sort of higher register language <coughs> at that time. All right. So, conclusions, very rough conclusions. We don't know where the Albanian language comes from, except that it's an Indo European language, right, like most of the languages of Europe. Um, so, so we do know where it comes from, but we don't know who spoke it and where exactly before we have the written documents, right? We have indications, we can give relative position towards Latin, Romanian, Slavic, etc., but not exactly where, uh, just by looking at the language. And the people living in what is now Albania probably changed their name and their language several times in the last millennia which is nothing new, nothing to worry about. This happened all over Europe and probably all over the world. If you have 2,000 years, uh, you have uh, time enough for this to happen. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. <laughs>